Call the meeting to order. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Supervisor Moore. Present. Councilwoman McNamara. Present. Councilwoman Tilly. Here. Councilman Pell. Here. Councilman Present. All right, we have uh, the agenda review, and uh, there'll be two public hearings. Well, one is with respect to considering amendments to the town code regarding road review requirements, and the other is for the adoption of the updated pattern book, which we haven't gotten the revised draft yet, so I would suggest that we put that hearing over for another, till the next month, maybe the September 10th meeting I give enough, uh, time for people right now I mean, I mean it, I, I'm just saying the changes at, were you know at the well we didn't get any changes back so we have to review the revised draft so I don't want to do that at the public hearing what so, you want to have the I, I wouldn't want time. it to delay another month excuse me Phil. well I don't want to be looking at the changes at the public hearing me neither it's Tuesday. two weeks, and I would support I would support putting it off till the tenth if we had a notice of adoption on the same night. Would that would that suffice? Yeah, that, I guess that, yeah, that would work. That would work, and yeah, so I, I by no means want to rush it. I I liked it the way it was, but you know, if you know that's fine. Comfortable with it at that point, then we can go ahead and adopt it. But if not, we can always adjourn it for more discussion. But there were a lot of comments at the last hearing that we had that Janice is incorporating into the book and. As far as I know, I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but I didn't get it back yet. No, I, I didn't either. Okay. I'm fine with that. So let's go ahead with the resolution. Town Board Resolution oh. 957 of 2024, Resolution of Adoption Amending Town Code, Chapter 312-26, Prohibiting <coughs> Parking, CR80, Montauk Highway, East Clog. I'm still waiting on the county on that. Okay. So Can I ask a question about that? So what, what did we decide on the public hearing? We closed uh, it. We're, so we're going to have a public hearing in September. Uh, with a possible notice of adoption. Oh, on the, on the pattern session? book? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still on that. You know, we, What's the question? Uh, um, so we're going to put the public this public hearing over to September 10th. Yes. And then we're going to put a notice of adoption, if we like it. On the same. Are we going to have a work session well, between depends. then? Because I, I know there was a lot of questions. I mean, you know, should we have this public hearing as well? You have no then, choice but to open this public hearing okay. in order to. Well, that's my understanding. Yes, is that's absolutely. you know, but we have moved public hearings in the past, so I'm just clarifying what we're yes. doing here because. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's cool. That's. <coughs> I'm good with that. Thank you. Okay. And uh, so, in this, I, I didn't see that we got anything yet. You said we're still waiting. No, nope, still waiting on the county. Okay. You're still waiting on what? The county. The county. I, I have a note. You're talking about, oh, you're talking about the resolution. Yeah, okay. sorry. Okay, uh, Town Board Resolution 47270, uh, amend Town Board Resolution 23-1284 to revise the distribution of CDVG funds for the fiscal year 2024 and authorize the supervisor to sign the project description forms. Town Board Resolution ID number 47269 to authorize the purchase of computers for police vehicles from Island Tech Services LLC using Omnia Partners contract and New York State OGS contract. Awesome. Sunday, could I co-sponsor, please? Can I? Um, I'm so sorry. Um, back to Town Board Resolution 47270 on page 6. I am a uh, co-sponsor to that. Um, the public service groups that are outlined here Excellent groups. Um, how, how are how are those determined? And um, uh, other groups that are in the community, if they're interested in this, is there a process? Do we know? It's an application process. It goes through goes through mm -hmm. Kara's office. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And and Jamie Bowden and um, these were what we did last year. I, I and they think. have to yeah, and they have mm -hmm. they have to. There's things they have to provide service. You know, details of what services they provide. Right. You know, proof that they've actually done those. You know, they can't just come in and say, we want to do this, give us money. There has to be some, you know, 
right. some history, so, some buy-in, and these are all vetted. So these groups that these are these applied in twenty three. Yes, got it. Okay, and some we can keep for the town if it's you know ADA compliant. Yes, <clears throat> yes. I thank thank you. Perfect. Town board resolution. Oh, who's next? I get that one. <clears throat> town board know. resolution four seven two six zero. Authorized push of drop deck tilt trailer from Bella Trail Inc. using source for contact. Town board resolution 47245. Authorized purchase of a 250 Ford van boating board using NYS contract. Town board resolution 47237. Authorized purchase of a Ford F550 with a dump body from Otis Ford Inc. using NYS contract. Town Board Resolution ID number 47259. Co-sponsor with Council Member Iacilli to authorize the purchase of a Ford Transit T350 from Ferrario Ford Inc. using New York State contract. Town Board Resolution ID 47261. Co-sponsor with Councilman Schiavone. Authorized purchases of lab services, soil and groundwater analysis from Pace Analytical Services Incorporated and Long Island Analytical Labs using Suffolk County contract. Town Board Resolution ID number 47257 to authorize purchases of supply and delivery of auto parts with Advanced Stores Company DBA Auto Advanced Auto Parts Grade A Petroleum Fleet Pride Inc. and Morgan Auto Supply Inc. using the East Hampton contract. Town Board Resolution 47220 authorizes the supervisor to issue a satisfaction of a buyer benefit note and mortgage on a community uh, benefit unit. <coughs> Excuse me. Town Board Resolution 47278, uh, co sponsored with Councilman Pell, and the previous was co sponsored with Council Member Iselli. Excuse me, gentlemen. Um, to authorize the supervisor to sign a contract with GEI Consultants Engineering, Geology, Architecture, and Landscape Architecture to develop a lake management plan for Long Pond and Little Long Pond in Sag Harbor. Town Board Resolution ID number 47272 to authorize the supervisor to sign a contract with historical concepts for professional conceptual design and visioning services for the comprehensive implementation of the Riverside Overlake District zoning. Town Board Resolution 47144, authorized pressure of heavy duty whale balancing from Mohawk Lift LLC using NYS OGS contract. Town Board Resolution ID number 47250 to authorize the supervisor to execute a 2024 preventive maintenance agreement with Best Climate Control for maintenance service on the air conditioning and or heating equipment at Southampton Town Police Department Main Building located at 110 Old Riverhead Road in Hampton Bays. Town Board Resolution 47281. Uh, this is to authorize the supervisor to sign a 2024 Southport Bakery uh, for the Special Needs Corporation Human Services Grant. Madam Clerk, if I can be a co-sponsor to that. Me as well. Myself too, please. Me too. Whole board. Sorry. Yeah. Was that everyone? Or yes. yes. What's the word missing, Janice? Yeah. Right. It, I think the special needs, I think the needs to come out. Are you signing something, a contract, or is it something? Well, maybe it is right. Oh, it's just grant. This is yeah, right. This it's is right. A, grant. Right. It just, Human it services just grant. It's awkward. read well, yeah, but it's, it's right. right. Uh, right. I'm sure Jamie put the actual name for the contract. Town Board Resolution ID number 47202 to award and authorize the supervisor to sign a contract with ADJO Contracting Corp for Town Hall Sanitary System Replacement. Town Board Resolution ID 47266, co sponsored with Councilman Iacilli, award and authorize the supervisor to sign a contract with Mercedes Benz of Southampton for Mercedes Benz Sprinter Cargo Van. Town Board Resolution ID number 47273, co-sponsored by the entire board to recall and amend Resolution number 2023-1206 as it relates to the source of funding. Town Board Resolution ID number 47265 to adopt the 2025 
budget process schedule. Yes, it's that time. Mm -hmm. Town Board Resolution ID number 47268 to authorize the general fund pay-as-you-go to purchase roll-off containers. I'd like to uh, put this one on hold. Excuse me? I'd like to um, put this on hold until the next meeting. What? It's a recommendation well, of the town engineer. And it's well to um, supervisors, Reza. Yeah. Yeah, so what... Are, because I want to make sure they buy the right containers because he bought containers before and they're not doing the job and they're only two weeks old and they're already falling apart. Well, maybe before Tuesday you could talk to Tom okay. and find okay. out what's happening with that. You know, okay. we don't want to buy something if it's not working. It's not the right thing for the job. Okay. Town Board Resolution ID number 47280. To recall and amend resolution number 2024-953 to authorize the highway fund pay-as-you-go for speed cameras. Town Board Resolution ID 47276, accept a donation for the Division of Senior Services in memory of Lester Elliston. Mr. Elliston um, appreciated all the work of the Berchampton Senior Center um, and left a $1,000 donation. Very nice. On the previous resolution, what's the change? What's the amendment from the original? Well, we didn't amend it. We just, like, you know, but in the meantime, Bill's going to. I'm going to go and look. See oh, what so maybe Tom would. No, they went from, from no, one the, contractor. No, the speed cameras. From Vigilant to Motorola. Oh, oh that resolution. Oh, different manufacturer. Sorry. Company? Yeah. And the numbers are the same. I don't have the uh, previous resolution to. I think they're the to. same. It was, under, it was just under 20,000. And this is also. And we passed that resolution last time mm -hmm. during our last town board meeting. Right. Right. So my question is between that and this, what's the amend? And thank you. Just yeah, it's the company times. that changes. All right. <clears throat> town board resolution ID number 47217 to authorize additional funds for legal services by Stephen Leventhal Esquire for Ethics Matters in 2024. Town Board Resolution ID number 47224 to authorize the settlement of the Suffolk County Department of Health Matter ENF-24-0008 for site number SITE-13464-OPC. Town Board Resolution ID number 47256 to authorize the town attorney to file a motion to intervene on behalf of the town of Southampton in the action of the Newburgh Realty to LLC against IPA Asset Management LLC and Island Properties and Associates LLC filed with the Supreme Court under index number 600124-2023. Town Board Resolution ID number 47166 to authorize the town to reimburse New York Municipal Insurance Reciprocal, NIMR, the deductible for bodily injury and property damage claims. Town Board Resolution ID 47267, co-sponsored with Councilman Iasilli. Authorization of cost reimbursement waiver for the Galilee Church of God in Christ violence-free block party, which was held on August 24th, 2024, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So it will be held on the 24th, but this weekend. Hence, our meeting will come after. Right. <laughs> Town Board meeting, yeah. Past reference. Town Board Resolution 47263, a release of maintenance bond in connection with Hampton, with Hampton Business District. Town Board Resolution 47149, authorizing the sole assessor to attend the 2024 NYSAA annual conference. Town Board Resolution ID number 47203 to accept the retirement of Elizabeth Roy, Senior Justice Court Clerk in the Justice Court. Town Board Resolution ID number 47244 to appoint Victoria Lopez to Senior Justice Court Clerk position in the Justice Court. Town Board Resolution ID number 47232 to accept the resignation of Thomas Payton III, police officer in the police department. On that one, I just wanted to note that um, Officer Payton is not resigning for any other reason except that he um, accepted a position at Suffolk County Police Department. So it will be sad to see him go. He is a local resident, he is a veteran, and he is a great officer. So. 
Town Board Resolution ID number 47254 to appoint Bernard Mulligan Jr. to Public Safety Dispatcher 3 position from the Civil Service List. Town Board Resolution ID number 47243 <coughs> to appoint Cameron Hanwright to Harbor Master 1 position in Southampton Town Police Department. Can I co-sponsor that, please? Thank you. Town Board Resolution ID number 47236 to appoint Susan Redding to Senior Office Assistant position in Municipal Works. Town Board Resolution ID number 47264 to appoint Johnny Bedell to the Sanitation Helper position in Municipal Works. Town Board Resolution ID number 47235 to appoint <coughs> Stephanie Orlando to Senior Assistant Senior Citizen Center Manager position from the Civil Service List. Town Board Resolution ID number 47234 to appoint Tony Latanzio to the Office Assistant in General Services. Town Board Resolution ID number 47242 to terminate an employee in the Municipal Works Department. <clears throat> Town Board Resolution 47247, uh, co-sponsor Councilman Pell. A notice of public hearing to consider the wastewater treatment pollution prevention projects proposed for the 2024 Community Preservation Fund, 20, CPF 20% 20 Water Quality Improvement Plan Grant Funding. And that public hearing will be at our work session, after the work session on September 5th, 2024 at 1 o'clock. Okay. Town Board Resolution 47153, notice of public hearing to consider a local law amended chapter 316A, abandoned vessel to change procedure of handling of, of abandoned vessels. Um, so what's this about? I mean, I thought we re resolved this <clears throat> issue already. What happened? I don't know. This is the first I saw about it. I did not know this was on this. This is the one where we said that you could ticket or this is the one that we just passed yeah. unanimously, um, and I drafted it with Public Safety and Marine Patrol, and neither one of them supports this version of this law for safety reasons. So I would ask that everybody, before this goes forward, reach out to Marine Patrol and Public Safety and get their input on this. I also questioned the 48 hours as we had the assistant town attorney at the podium who handed us the New York State Real Property Law and said that it 48 hours would be considered an illegal taking. So I would not like to put him in the position now where he has to get to the podium and say that that's okay because he is on record saying it's is not it, okay. Is, is the 48 hours the change? The way we There's left a lot it, of changes. The way we left it last time was that at any time that somebody is illegally tied up, they can be ticketed. ticketed. We can impound, yeah. but we can't sell it until after 40, 10 days. Day. So that's, I thought everybody was satisfied yeah. with that, but, um, well, Bill, I mean, this is your, uh, this, I, what, what's, what's the story? I don't know how I got to be sponsor of this. Um, okay. All right. So why don't we, this. um, I mean, if you, I, I would just take it out and, and investigate it more. Okay. 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 Thanks, Bill. Sounds like there's some questions. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. So you withdrawing. When you said take it out, do you mean the resolution off the agenda? Yes. And then you let us know. No, let us know. Going I'll on. talk to her. I okay. guess Sean's doing it. Yeah. I think he would have called me. Lack of communication in that department, I guess. Town Board Resolution 47262, uh, co sponsored Councilman Pell, a notice of public hearing to consider the aquatic habitat restoration and non point source abatement and control projects proposed for 2024 Community Preservation Fund, CPF, 20% water quality improvement. Plan grant funding. And that'll be at our after our September oh, right. 19th work session. Yes. Okay. It's a little different this year. Town Board Resolution 47191, uh, setting a public hearing for a deed of dedication of open space in connection with the final conditional approval of the Rothman Dynast Dynasty subdivision in the hamlet of Watermill. And that'll be on September 24th. 
Town Board Resolution ID 47282, Notice of Public Hearing to Consider Amending Town Code Chapter 330-210, Miscellaneous Provisions of Article 22, Signs, as it relates to the placement of political signs. So this is this is re this is returning what um, what is are there changes here? There is changes. I took the feedback from this board. Um, this is actually just clarifying the fact that um, if you read the legislative intent, it basically says if we're that discussing it, I'm recusing. I don't mean to interrupt. Okay. Any this would be a new one. It's a new one. Discussing it. Um, I'll just read you the, the legislative intent. It's pretty clear. The Town Board of the Town of Southampton recognizes the changing needs of the general public, seeks to maintain the visual aesthetic of the town, reduce litter and debris, reduce roadway distractions, reduce potential adverse impacts to safety of passing motorists and pedestrians, and reduce clutter on roadways so that directional signs relating to the public health, safety, and welfare may be unobstructed. With respect to Town Code 330.210A, the Town Board seeks to clarify that while political signs are exempt from permits and fees, the posting of political signs, as with all other signs on town properties and town right-of-ways, remain a violation. And that's already in the code, so all we are doing is clarifying it to say no sign inclusive of political signs other than a sign erected by a governmental agency or permitted under another section of this code shall be erected or placed within the right-of-way lines of a public street, and the town may remove any such signs without notice to us. So is this essentially a memorialization Pretty of much, yes. the existing and code? It's just, it's just making it very clear because I think, and I, I myself, you know, it, it was apparent that not many people understood that they thought that political signs were just exempt from the code, and when in fact they're only exempt. Well, the, way, the way the code is written it's does hard, provide yes. sort of that that language but if you actually read it it says it's only so it's only exempt from sections a b and c which are permits administrative permits and fees that's it it's not exempt from this but this also to your point memorializes the fact that business signs all their signs are not permitted in the in the right of ways can someone ask tommy john to return to the room please <laughs> can you tell tommy john he can come in okay. <laughs> Good morning, Jim. Good morning, Good morning. Jim. How was your drive? <laughs> you came in at exactly the right moment. <laughs> oh, uh, thank you, Kelly. I was like, I'm here. I was like, I need to wait to 10:30. Mr. Ellis, I'm more than capable. Are you going to come back? Reading or, now. Uh, thank you. Thanks. We'll see you. We got uh. I guess he thought it was going to be a long discussion. It went all the way back to his office. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to read his, uh, no, his here. right here? I'm sure he'll want to be here for that. We're on page 51. Okay. The recordings are on a slight delay. So. Uh, Town Board Resolution 47239, co sponsor with Councilman Yaselli, uh, authorized the acquisition of a workforce housing deed restriction on the property located at 11 Suffolk Street, Sag Harbor, through the Community Housing Fund. I spoke with Kara about this last night. I didn't realize it was on here, but I did mention to her that something that occurred to me about the um, you know, that we shouldn't allow any subsequent mortgages to go on the property without our consent. So she said she was going to add that language because, um, you know, if we're paying off a mortgage, mm -hmm. we don't want them to go and borrow yeah. more money. So she'll make that, so, that yeah. addition? That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good point. That's and so how would, that, how would that go? Would that be with the approval of the town board or yes. with just a restriction completely? It's, yeah. already, it's already in the deed we got last I, night. I, I would think without so. Prior, without prior The one prior, that we got prior. last night had that in it. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, maybe she put it in after our phone conversation yeah. yesterday. It was definitely in there. Well, that's a prudent thing to do. Okay. I have um, a banker attorney on the uh, town board resolution 47246, uh, co sponsor and council member Yuseli, authorize the acquisition of the properties located at 320 McGee Street and 370 Moses Lane in Tuckahoe for, for the production of community housing through the Community Housing Fund. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, well, can you add my name to that, please? That's co-sponsor. 
Sorry. Yeah. My name. So it's you can add me as well. Me Sunday, as please. well, Sunday. You want to be on that too? Put your on there. Come on. Sorry. Town Board Resolution ID number 47199 to recall and amend Resolution 2020-904 Road Review Application for Kirk Warner 0900-076.00-05.00-015.000 situate at North Sea is accepted. Town Board Resolution ID number 47196 to recall and amend Resolution 2023-1424 Road Review Application for Take 2 Capital LP. Suffolk County Tax Map number 900-382-1-4.6 situated in West Hampton is accepted. And Town Board Resolution ID number 47198, Road Review Application for 8 Luther Drive, LLC, Suffolk County Tax Number 900-178-01-017.053, situated in Watermill, is accepted. Town Board Resolution 47187, uh, co-sponsored with the entire board. Recall and amend uh, Town Board Resolution number... 652 of 2024 as it relates to donation and transfer of a land that terminate at the terminus of Bay Bluff Way, uh, NOYAC to the Community Preservation Fund and uh, amendment of CPF project plan and CPF management and stewardship plan to include the property. Uh, this is the, uh, we, we need to outline the extension of the property which actually goes out into the water a little bit. So this is a clarification of what is actually being transferred. Thank you. Okay, so that brings us to our next topic, which is the uh, Tiana Bayside Gabion issue. But I don't see Aram here just yet. He said he was going to do about five minutes. Traffic. Okay. Traffic was horrible. Traffic was there. Yeah. But we can start. Yeah, why don't you come on up, um, Kelly Doyle, Assistant Town Attorney, and uh, Kristen. Kristen Dulos from Parks and Recreation. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Hello. Everyone. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> it was Kristen that first brought this to our attention in May with an email letting us know about the plight of the horseshoe crab. And then some of us went and saw for ourselves, and then we got Aram involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't know if you want to get. It, so it, the fifth plan has been going on for, what, what six, 60 years? Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, like a few years ago, I was brought into some. Um, preliminary plans for, uh, this is part of contract three, the Tiana uh, Bayside facility. Um, and Which is part of contract three of the thing? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so at that time, we did have some concerns as to whether continuing to keep the Gabion system that's been in place since about 2005 um, was the best path forward, um, given that it it's, now in deteriorated condition um, and has exposed wire baskets um, that are sharp and rusty. Um, and it makes it difficult for us to run the various recreational programs we have down there, um, which include Cornell Cooperative Extension, um, who we have a partnership uh, and have a mar maritime educational center down there. They run camps um, and oyster gardening. So the oyster gardening cages are located um, off the floating docks and people have to get over those gabions to access those. So we were even talking about trying to limit the program um, because it's difficult for people to access. We also run sailing on the western side of the property. We run swimming on the eastern side of the property. We run Nipper Guard um, with about 60 kids um, in the little sandy area <laughs> that's left um, where gabions aren't uh, exposed. 
So there's a lot of things that go on there. It's a it's a robust facility, and we would hate to use uh, to not be able to continue those uses. Can um, you tell us about what when it was put in? I mean, I know it's a long time ago. You said 2005, but what was the thinking at the time? What was the purpose of? There had been a bulkhead there, and I think at the time the um, the the way everything was going was to remove the hardened structures from shorelines. And so this was meant to be um, in place of that to provide uh, shore stabilization. But one other really important thing I want to mention, and hi, Aaron, Hello, um, Aaron. Thank is you. that the horseshoe crab, um, it is a major spot for them to spawn in the spring. And thousands, maybe tens of thousands of them have been getting trapped um, landward of the Gabions, and they can't get back out until another high tide comes in, and sometimes it's not high enough to even carry them over. So there were volunteers, as there have been for the last few years. I think the tides have, have increased somewhat um, over the years. Have to then relocate hundreds of them back into the water, um, and also some get trapped under the decking in the facility, and some perish. Um, so that's another major reasoning for why you know we're looking for an alternative to the scabian system, which um, I don't. I'm sure Aaron has has more to talk about with that, so I don't want to get too much into that. That's just like a little background. On. Mm -hmm. Right, that's good to know the Just background. for the public certification, Gabion system, right? That's, so that's, that's rip wrap wrapped in uh, a wire it's, mesh. It's like a now, wire, well, I'm sure Aaron can say, a wire cage, mm -hmm. sort of, and they put rocks inside of it to try to prevent erosion. And there should right. be, there's supposed to be, the idea is to have it buried under the sand, but these keep, they become exposed and every time sand gets put back it ends up washing away and they become exposed again. And forgive me, are there, are there crabs? There's crabs like inside or horseshoe crabs? crabs? Well, they, well, they, they, get, so they, get, they get trapped, trapped right? Yeah. Because it's um, because it, it, what form, it forms a barrier. There, yeah. there are some photos in there That's you can see. Um, years yeah. ago. The water, they kind of yeah. swim yeah. probably yeah. over them yeah. at high tide yeah. and yeah. then they get stuck the low tide. Sand and then Michael, the their tails yeah. get caught on it too. Years ago, they thought this is the way to do put the rocks inside a cage. Yeah. But they today, it's not the thing to do. Yeah, right? yeah. It was we've, good for like two years. We've become more knowledgeable realized, on yeah, this. Yeah. yeah. And the, so for the FIMP project, what they, um, the Army Corps had proposed was to just cover the gabions in sand and place actually a lot of sand um, in this area and that would potentially interfere. There are some um, eel grass restoration areas mm -hmm. um, you can see on here. And oh, when did the Army Corps recommend that? Is that recently? Yeah, it's it's part of the overall fit plan. These are called coastal processes features. They call them CPFs. It's a little confusing. Mm -hmm. Just what we know to be a CPF. Um, and so this has been um, on the books with them for a number of years. The town has continually raise concerns about uh, uh, the Corps' uh, desires here. And so they've held off on finalizing anything until they got feedback from us. So they wanted us to just keep adding sand to bury the gabion. And also sand that would have interfered with the dockage. And, you know, it just, <clears throat> the plan that they proposed was, uh, I think, in without the knowledge of the way that the town and the environment uses that space. Are they aware that the crabs yeah. are getting trapped in there? They are now. They weren't before. Got it. And these are horseshoe crabs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which is... Because it's just dangerous to begin with. Mm -hmm. And it's actually, right now, there's a there's a legislation pending, uh, waiting for the governor's signature to protect horseshoe crabs from, from any kind of mm -hmm. uh, fishing. Or, yeah, or, but right now, it's unlimited harvest. Right. And which means that literally they fill up boats with them. Right. And the surrounding states, Connecticut, mm -hmm. New Jersey, have already mm -hmm. instituted legislation so that protects it from okay, I think doing that. Quarter, quarter We're the only state in the area that's still yeah, doing that. It's during certain dates, too. But, yeah. but yeah, it's it's yeah, it's a little disheartening. You're putting those horseshoe crabs back, and then people are just harvesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was there's, there's, yeah, there's a yeah. quota. Yeah. We were that day we were there with the supervisor, right? Because the guy I mean, I'm wondering right if they outside have, the coast. You're trying to save um, them, and then there's a boat out there waiting for them to, to float be, back yeah. out. And, 
be caught. I'm wondering if they have that knowledge, don't, wouldn't that prompt some sort of action? They do, um, and I know that Marty had actually written a letter to them, I want to say it was maybe about so three or four years ago. Packet, yeah. June of 2022. Yeah, yeah. June 16th. Okay, yes, 2022, um, ah. bringing it to their attention. Mm -hmm. That, that was probably the first year where we started really seeing that That's issue right. with the horseshoe crabs, yeah. um, where it was to that level. Yeah. And it's just continued to be that way over the course of the past three years. So, yeah, so the core, you know, they, you know, what they said was, well, listen, if you don't like our plan, give us an alternative. Okay. And so uh, we, we did a site inspection, I think it was about a few months ago. Some month ago. Beginning and of the summer. Beginning okay. of the summer. Yeah. It was a very nice day. <laughs> yes, <sunburn runs>. yes. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, uh, it, well, I was really valuable for me because we had so many uh, different uh, stakeholders there. <clears throat> you know, the parks uh, people, the Cornell Cooperative Extension, who was heavily involved in the uh, oyster farming, as well as <clears throat> excuse me, town supervisor, and um, we're able to. Um, <clears throat> really become more knowledgeable about the various um, activities that were taking place that needed to be uh, not just safeguarded, but enhanced going forward. And so, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm getting over a three-day cold. So uh, what I did was, uh, in, the, in the package you have, um, I looked at what's called a living shoreline, which is, um, at, at the present time, is the preferred way that, that the state um, likes to handle uh, erosion situations. As you know, Councilman Pell knows um, this has been before the uh, Town Trustees Board as well. Uh, various projects in Riches Bay, also in the Sag Harbor area. And the object is to uh, find the appropriate balance of uh, gray and green uh, mm -hmm. to, to uh, create a stable shoreline that's sustainable over time and doesn't end up with situations like what we're dealing with now, which is basically the legacy of, of an old technology. And, and uh, so the, the gray in, this, uh, in these cases are things like rock and sand, and the green are things like vegetation. And so uh, uh, I've included in your package a project that we did uh, over the last several years in Ridges Bay, where we've incorporated offshore breakwaters, uh, spartina planting, uh, and onshore um, uh, uh, dunes and rock reitments uh, cored in the dune. Oh, thanks. <laughs> That's, what service are you at here? <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah. Where, um, where are you looking? So if you go all the way to the back, well, actually right there, you, on that page you're at right, right there, that's, that's, that's the yeah. project we did. So that's what it looked like when we started. Uh, yeah. Uh, is that page I think uh, I think the next page is maybe Yeah, and so so that area was very very eroded, and then um, uh, you can see this is uh, houses from six twelve to six twenty eight Dune Road in West Hampton, mm -hmm. and then if you go to uh, there's a before and after. It looks like this, and so. Um, you can see that what we did was create a series of offshore breakwaters that created these very stable sandy embayments behind them. And um, the the reason that so, this, are you talking about the rock, like the the buildup of the rocks there? Yeah, see like see yep. the little uh, crenulate shapes, which right are there? yeah, the little crescent beaches. Uh huh. Yeah. So it creates a very stable crescent beach like that, which is really ideal for horseshoe crabs, for um, uh, shorebirds, and for uh, uh, and, and for uh, uh, other wildlife, other wildlife, but <laughs> vegetation as well. <laughs> what is that? Because there's uh, breaks in them. Is that yeah. why? So what what it does is it, it creates a still area behind there, and and the, the gap between each one of them is calculated in order to uh, provide a, a log spiral beach <coughs> behind it that's stable you want, the, you want the water to come over this, you want the water to come flood this. Yeah. Um, it's very important to get the right angle on this. If you have the wrong angle, you get a backlash to the water hits it, so you want the water to roll right over this, slow it down. Mm -hmm. And it's been successful? Yeah. So how are those rocks held in place? The, by gravity. 
You don't need the uh, don't cage, need the, cage. the metal cage. They're probably weigh they like key into one 500 another. pounds. 500 pounds. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, not like the ones there. No. And the jetty keys into one another. Uh, more, this is yeah, they're this fitted. Is. They're fitted. Yeah. And if you uh, if you look at, at this after photo, you can see, um, you know, that's what it Why wasn't what? something like this done at North Sea Beach? Uh, mm -hmm. Because the the, the, the the sand motion is more effective now. Okay. Because we have such a ready source of sand. The olivine in North Sea? Well, the olivine was only about 5% of that overall problem. So if the horseshoe crabs don't know to go in the gaps, well, get it's back interesting in the water. because um, we have a lot of horseshoe crabs here. They love it. They come in, they come in in the gaps. They they burrow right in, lay their eggs, and go out with the next tide. And because uh, it's just we, we've I don't know last this is our third season that we're uh, that we're monitoring this project, and. Um, we, uh, you know, this is an area that was eroding so fast, horseshoe crabs couldn't nest here because <clears> as soon as they nested and laid their eggs, the next storm just washed everything away. And so we have, I don't know, I wouldn't say a hundred, but dozens of horseshoe crabs. And the other thing is that the rocks themselves are like English muffins. They have tons of nooks and crannies. And so you get this encrusting algae, which brings in the small bait fish, which brings in the crabs and everything else. So. It really uh, creates this. Uh, you, really, might get, uh, you might get oysters to set on it. So. You can get oysters. Yeah, we, we 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 threw a few dozen oysters in there and see if they're going to take hold. And what are the effects on the on the on the bay side of the hardened structures? Um, um, on the base of the sand yeah. staying, or is it getting washed out? No, the, you know, because that, hardened structures. What, what you see here is stable. You, uh, this was this photo was taken two years ago. You go down there today, it looks just like that. They did have they did have problems over the years, but they keep on correcting the problems. It, it's like I'm done, and they won't go go along with it. One one of the I, issues we I had. You see the houses they, and they, the problems. They, well, yeah, they, when, when they built this, they had the wrong angle and they had to move stuff. Right. And, well, and one of the things that we do in this. Right, the scout. One of the things that we learned was we have to do two or three years of vegetative planting to get it to take hold. Yeah. So this year we're actually. That's part time. That's time. good. So, how um, how long do you project them? Uh, these uh, buffers, natural buffers, to last? Oh, these these have like a three year life. That's great. Yeah. So it, th this is Spart Spartina alternate flora. That's on this. Uh, I'm on page. Uh, I'm looking page at the house. <laughs> yeah. No, or that's, is that that's dune a, grass? That's beach grass. Yeah. Um, in, in, on the right, but there is Spartina in the crescent itself. So. If you look closely, you'll see we planted in there. And these photos are, as I said, they're a couple of years old. Um, but also, uh, we, we worked on um, this project uh, for Suffolk County at um, Indian Island. And um, if you may not remember, but um, at the end of Circle Drive, there was a bluff that was continuously eroded. And it's actually in, um, uh, an, indigenous, uh, an indigenous burial ground. And, after wow. one storm, there were artifacts sticking out of the block. Really? So um, the county uh, came and, and was in search of a solution to solve that. Wow. And you can see on these two, this this was just constructed in the last 12 months. Wow. And you can go out there and take a look. It's doing really, really well. Wow. The Peconic so, Estuary Partnership had a tour and oh, uh, yeah. on their boat and, and showed us all that particular project. That's a pretty significant jetty out on that point. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, okay. but what's really neat about it now, there was zero public access there before because it was just a, a, a vertical 12 foot drop and a fence, so you couldn't get down there. Now they have a really nice uh, walkway down and uh, I mean, it's really nice. You could put a house on it, so, <laughs> or a cabin. Does it make sense to include um, the work here um, into the, uh, Threatened and Endangered Species Program with the trustees, or is it? I mean, I know that they have that program. Um, you know, it, because it is. Th you know, the, the, obviously the crabs. Horseshoe crabs aren't aren't a threatened or endangered species. You know. um, but are there other species that could? Well, be it, it's identified? a potential feeding ground uh, for, for the uh, not for the red, the red knot, knot and yeah. the uh, and potentially the piping clover as well. Yeah, more oh, well, like red knots because the red knots actually go go after the horseshoe crab. They do. I like the eggs. Okay. So the, the horseshoe crabs, what I thought was happening is that they couldn't get back in until the 
tide came up and they were getting stuck. Right. So now with this, they wouldn't have to wait for the tide to come in. They can they go, easily yeah. Yeah. They go right in through the gap cross. and right out through the gap. Or over the, they wouldn't be able to no, go over they the rocks. Really, so. don't really go over. They will find, they'll, they'll keep on going. They'll hit this and go. Yeah, it's, it's, it, I, have, I have video of the horseshoe crabs. They come in, they bump up against the rocks, and then they feel their way around until they get yeah. to the sand, and then they just dig in, yeah. do their thing, and they go. Aaron, what makes um, certain places better candidates for breakwaters versus sand renourishment? Um, a couple of things. Uh, number one is the availability of sand. So if you don't have a ready source of, you know, economically viable sand, you've got a problem because you need to hold on to all the sand you have. Uh, the other thing is the, uh, is the type of shoreline. Is it uh, an open shoreline or is it compartmentalized? And the other part is the length of the shoreline. So for example, if you're on the Atlantic Ocean, you need a mile of beach to build a project. But if you're on, um, on the, you know, uh, Shinnecock Bay or, you know, you can do it with a few thousand feet. But again, if you don't have a ready source of sand where you know you can come back in every year and place that sand, because you have to do it. On the bay, you really have to do it every year because you can't build a big enough beach. Is it the wave action there? And it's, so it's the wave action. And in this, tide, the way, the weather. What really works on this site is that the entire thing is compartmentalized. You have uh, a, uh, uh, a groin on the, on the west end and a solid fill dock on the east end and it just creates a really nice compartment and by putting the sand in by adding the sand as part of the project you create the stable system right and it's locked in on both sides so you don't have leakage going out either end because mm -hmm. end losses are what really so this is this is what you're proposing. Yeah, that's what we're proposing. Has that affect the dock that's there right now for the boats to pull up? To? No impact. You can see the dock. Uh, the, all the breakwaters are uh, landward of the dock, and the um, so the dock is still completely serviceable, and the um, uh, the two recreational areas for sailing and swimming are also uh, would remain accessible. And where are those on this picture? Uh, they're in the beginning. Is there any grant funding available for this? Any help? Well, I, we're gonna, uh, I forwarded these plans to the Army Corps and said, this You do this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you do this, this now? <laughs> that's the goal. <laughs> so that's the funding source. <laughs> okay. I like it. Uh, um, CPF water quality funds could potentially be to maybe in the future if there's uh, ongoing maintenance involved. Um, I know Cornell is a willing uh, partner there as well in, you know, the planting, the planting, uh, planting the living shoreline. They also grow some of their own native uh, grasses at the location. Right. Yeah, just removing those and putting this in just seems like a very labor-intensive, costly process. And Yeah. Yeah, that's oh, why we, we want to try to get <laughs> but, into but, the FIMP But, project. you know, the beauty here is that under the FIMP project, they're obligated in, in their design to create these coastal process features. Well, the object is to mimic nature. And so they were doing it with all just sand. Mm -hmm. We're going to put in a whole bunch of sand, and that's going to be natural. So, um, but, uh, uh, the, you know, this accomplishes the same goal, uh, just with a different mix of materials. What's really... Um, I think important to us are, are a couple of things. Number one, um, this really uh, services the people and the uh, and the resources that are using the area. It, it's not just respectful; it's enhancing to that. Yeah. The second part is that uh, last year, uh, the legislature passed and the governor signed the law that said, um, on every project that's reviewed in the state, you have to first do an analysis of whether or not a living shoreline is going to work. And so the feds are obligated through the Coastal Zone Management Act of 1972 to uh, adhere to you know, these uh, New York State policies. And I think that the Army Corps is looking for a solution. They're not, I don't think that they're in a situation where they're like, this is what you're gonna get. I think they're <coughs> saying, how can you help us? 
facility. But obviously, sometimes these pro sometimes these projects do take time. So I think it would also be beneficial, and I'm happy to hear some recommendations, other recommendations, but to also gain uh, maybe a letter um, of support from also the county of this particular project, especially as it uh, pertains to FEMP's uh, implementation of it. The state would be our better partner on that. Okay. Because the, the state is the partner with FEMP. Okay. The county is not, um, and not, not involved not, in not on this project. They, they were in the fire yeah. island. Yeah, they're in fire island, but not in the center. Okay. Yeah. Aaron, is this configuration considered a living shoreline? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I'm seeing, you know, what, what, the 12 small lagoons, and um, I, I, and it looks like rock, riprap, um, that's a construction. How do uh, horseshoe crabs nest in this? Well, um, behind the, the breakwaters, um, that lighter color is all sand. So they can make it over the rock. No, they, they go in the opening. They come through the through the gap. So, so when one of the, when you look at living shore, no, I, I get that. But uh, on the on the shore side of this, I, I'm just I'm seeing a hard structure. So I, I need a little bit more on, this, on this how this is, is right a, a living coastline. It looks like rock. Yeah. Are you yeah. saying it's sand? It's, yeah, it's all on sand. the last page. The, this uh, <clears throat> behind the the shore parallel breakwaters. Well, behind there is all sand. The white is sand. Where it's a, I'm on the last page yeah. here, and where it says new shoreline, that's not rock, that's sand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, everything it does look like it's, it could be rock. I could, I could make it a little brown. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> that's okay. I'm just, just, the well, th th I, right, that I, too. I, I, I have to, yeah. Uh, okay. I have to talk yeah, about I have a question that. for you. And, I mean, I just, this is, um, right. all right. You have these, I know this is not the final drawing. Right. Are you going to do it straight across, or are you, you going to zigzag and put curves? Because if if all these are straight across, mm -hmm. then you're going to get the backlash when the wave hits it. Well, like how you did the other ones, you got to stagger. Well, uh, what we're going to do is um, we're going to we're going to do a well. What we're going to do is we're going to ask the Army Corps to do a numerical model yeah. and uh, come up with the optimal design. <clears throat> because a project like this, you want to numerically model it. Yeah. Because you, you you know it's it's and and they would that's their standard operating procedure. Because they they usually they curve them more. They, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, different um, orientations uh, that will all depend upon the wave model. Okay. Um, would there be spot for oyster gardening to still yeah. take place? Yeah. Where where do you um, <clears throat> Well, I guess the floating dock would still be off the breakwater. Right. Um, so I guess in between. Well, um, yep. We have to look at that in a little more detail. Um, may, um, there's a um, mathematical relationship between the, uh, the gap opening and then the distance to the crescent. And so you want to maintain that, and what uh, that may uh, involve is pushing the uh, the floating dock offshore a little bit farther. But there's plenty of deep water there. You have to see um, what the, the wave act is going to be. Whether if it's if it's curved, it's going to curve all the whole thing. But if it's straight like this, you're going to have a lot of backlash from the waves and hit it and go back. So you have to then then you have to be careful where you put your float. Yeah. On the easternmost side of this project, right? Uh, I'm assuming those are either existing or new bulkheads. Um, Everything's existing on the east side. Okay. So the bulkhead all the way to the east of of the parcel is in place and it has not scoured. All right. That's that's that would not be a new structure. Correct. That's just kind of sad. Cause I remember going here for guppies when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And it was this big beach, and you just walk right in, and now it's all. But it was bulkheaded at that time. It was. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, I don't have any issues with this. It looks great to me, and I think Same. groins work actually. But I thought that the, you know, people thought that they were against hardened structures. That there's some theory that you're not supposed to put those in. I mean, I think they work, but. Is that true? That well, you know, you know, everything done incorrectly is is bad. <laughs> if 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 it's done, <clears throat> you know, properly with you know good engineering and good science, it works really really well. And that's, 
you know that there was a lot of backlash about hard structures and groins after what happened at West Hampton. Let's face it, and that literally went nationwide. Um, but then but, they actually know, work when the cells filled in. But you know, it, it, there were mistakes were made and mistakes were corrected. But you know, this is you know right from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and you know this uh, is don't don't say no. Don't prohibit something that may be useful when used in the proper manner. And so that's why it's so important to look at the proper mix of gray and green, to do the numerical modeling, to talk to the stakeholders, to make sure that you're addressing the concerns um, you know, of, about how the shoreline's gonna be used in the future. So I think that this, I mean, this is obviously extremely preliminary, but I think it has the right elements. And the determining factors to, to install what you're proposing, the breakwater, as opposed to edging or vegetation only, um, what, what are the variables there? The, the big I mean, I know we kind of listed them earlier. It's wind, it's pitch, it's tides, it's... Yeah. Well, here it's, but, all, it's all fetch. So it's all, it's all wind over water. So if you have more than a mile of fetch, mm -hmm. um, you, you can't use vegetation alone. It's unstable. It's too much power behind it's it. It's too much power behind the wave. A wave, a wave is... So with, Chinnacock Bay with no break in the wind, and then it hits yeah. this yeah, shoreline. You're yeah, saying multi, that the, the energy uh, is too powerful yeah, uh, just to put in a, a, a vegetation only system at this time because it'll just get washed out in Europe. What are you saying with that calculus, that formula? If it's over what? Uh, if it's over a mile of, of uh, distance over water that the wind blows, then vegetation's unstable. It, it can be shorter of a mile, too, if it's deeper. If it's deeper. Aaron, something I'd ask that you could potentially come back on. Obviously, you're not prepared to speak about it today, but we have a real issue with we're losing Ponquag Beach. Um, the bowl is completely decimated again, and you know this is usually when we're putting sand back, and I don't think we're in a good place for going into the winter. Yeah, I'll, I'll I, I, uh, I apologize. I haven't been down, down there because I, I spent sunny days in bed. Um, <laughs> but um, he, here's... Pompwag itself, I think, will be fine. So we might have lost a little bit of beach, but the dune there is very, very deep. So I'm not really concerned about that, but the bowl I am, because that's a chronic loss area. Mm -hmm. And the thing to do with, with that is that you, you as, as the local leader, you have to be proactive with the Army Corps, because the Army Corps is always reactive. And <clears throat> the key thing with the Army Corps is what they call Public Law 8499. And that is the Army Corps' equivalent of FEMA. So that is the authority that allows them to come in and repair a, pro a federally constructed project that is below specification due to a particular storm event. So there has to be, in order for that to happen, there has to be a, quote, extraordinary storm, which is really nebulously defined. And uh, then there has to be a proof that the project is actually below the design level. And uh, that's typically done by taking shore perpendicular profiles by surveyors, you know, that show that what, it's supposed to be this big and it's this big. Yeah. Um, and then that gets presented um, through the state to the Army Corps and say, hey, your project uh, is below spec and you need to come fix it. Because we have drone photos right now and it's... Photos are no good. I know, but yeah. I'm just saying you can see with the naked eye that oh, it's... Yeah. You know, we're there and, you know, we're putting millions of dollars into the Shinnecock fishing fleet. And is it a viable location anymore if they're not going to make this a long term solution? Well, it is a long term solution because <clears throat> they have the federal authority to act. But, um, and, and it's not a new construction, it's operation and maintenance. Uh, the key is that um, uh, you, you, you just have to stay on top of the Army Corps all the time. So for us yeah. then, because we don't have that expertise, obviously, on staff. What would that look like for us to make sure we're not, you know, sitting there waiting for it to break through and we're getting, like, we're getting to that point before we're basically engaging with them. So well, the We were at that point. That's actually yeah. counting yeah. up. So. We actually yeah. plugged it. I was on that email string with, with Bill Hillman, mm -hmm. who's really good. Yeah, Bill's good. And, um, and, and they have a survey team or they have, they can contract through a county annual contract to get a survey team out there to run these profiles, which will demonstrate that we're below. So it's just staff. us notifying them, pretty much? Well, partnering. Yeah. And Aaron, as far as the bowl is concerned, the reason why that 
problem exists is because of the Army Corps of Engineers construction of the Shinnecock Inlet back in the 1930s, you know, once it cut through it. Well, <clears throat> local in the 30s, state in the 60s, and uh, or local in the 40s, state in the 60s, and feds in the 90s. There we go. <clears throat> Okay, right, um, so I mean, it's blocking sand from lateral yeah. drift, and yeah. I, I mean, because they are now part of that commitment, you know, uh, we need a sand pass through. Yeah, that's the main thing. Yeah, it's, 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 it's going to be really, really hard to get. Um, so, so when you do sand bypass, there's two methods of sand bypass. One is called a fixed plant, which is exactly what it sounds like. So on, on one side of the inlet, there's a plant, and it pumps sand to the other side of the inlet. Um, they've been trying to get that for decades. It's not going to happen. The county kiboshed the last one by. Uh, expensive. It's very expensive. Um, but they they they, um, uh, they declared alienation of parkland. Hmm. Uh, so there was no place to put the physical plant because that's all county cost. So the second solution is what they call floating bypass, which means you bring a dredge. And you pump the sand around. Yeah. Um, the problem with that is you've got to get appropriations all the time. Even though it's O&M, you've got to be on the list. And compounding this is the jetting effect that actually sucks the sand back into the, the Chicago the Bay with the tides. You can actually do living shoreline stuff there. Well, I mean, why don't we talk about it, if not today, then another yeah. time? Because we do need a long-term solution. You can't just keep pumping sand there yeah. and spending all yeah. this money. It's a Within the last five or six years, they did well, two not, huge projects in that it, area. Just in the last five years, they did two, well, like, you know, hundreds of well, thousands of cubic yards of sand in that area. We're, we're, we're spending part of it because it's all our money. But uh, the point is, I think that's everybody at the table recognizes, it, it, there's got to be a better way. Yeah. Right. And there is. Well, I just feel like we're just we're just always behind, you know. Well, it, yeah, like we're always behind. The other thing is that you know when the right damage now. does come, we take it in the teeth. Well, yeah, we, yeah, us and the businesses. So, mm -hmm. so what? So, if you have some ideas on what's the better way? Uh, yeah, I mean, because I right, think they so would be regroup. Because <laughs> I think they would be, you know, just to protect the fleet. I mean, it's it's commerce. It's commerce. Second largest <laughs> fishing fleet in the state. No, not anymore. Not anymore? Montauk is. Um, but we're it, the second, right? Yeah, the second. Because if we lose the Shinnecock fleet, the interstate and commerce, and they go through federal money. So yeah. that's how we got the original dredging from that's the 85. Yep. Exactly right. right. First time it was dredged. Because the boats are built down south, and it, it's a whole history of, on that. So, so, so the, the next, next step, step with, with this, this is, uh, well, I sent this out to the Army Corps. You did already? Get their feedback. What I uh, like to report to them is that I've spoken to this board, and this board is generally supportive of the concept, and they'd like the Army Corps to investigate. Sounds good to me. Yes. Looks like a nice project. Do the same in the board. So what do you think is going to happen? I mean, are they... It's going to take them years. Yeah, yes. but, so, okay, so we don't want to wait years. So, um, so we want to do as an interim? Yeah. Um, now... I, I would have to circle back with the trustees, but they um, they're going to they got some money to do dredging in the intercoastal, or I guess the Army Corps is going to be yeah. dredging the intercoastal maybe this fall winter. They can and pump the sand up there. We had um, requested that they put the sand on the gabions. Um, Scott was involved with that, and he he was supportive of it. I don't know how effective that will be. We know it washes out relatively quickly. I if it buys us a couple of years. Maybe it's you would well buy done. us even a year, you know. I feel like anything would be better than nothing. Yeah. But the only thing I don't like is that when the sand washes out it comes around the <laughs> other side of the pier and fills in our swim area. But, but we can recycle that dredged. sand. <laughs> well, could we uh, when on we, the east when, side. When on the east side. That's yeah. what I was asking about with the okay. When you reach out yeah. to but the that's stable. Army Corps asking not stable. um well, letting them know oh that God, we are generally on. supportive I'll of this project. Are you able to, um, you know, get some sort of timeline that they would expect it to go? I know that you're saying a couple of years, um, but is there any more of a concrete timeline that they might be able to provide just to give us some, some understanding of what they expect and how we may want to engage with the state to, you know, sort of, you know, escalate this to something more? Important environmentally, because I think I think anything yeah, is possible. Is yes, but that's going to take months to get that answer. As mm -hmm. as as council will tell you, getting an answer out of the army corps is an adventure. Is contract three tied to the easement agreement? 
Yes. yes. That, oh, okay. Yeah, this doesn't require this obviously. This would have been contract two, but, but because of the concerns that we had, they took it out of contract two. Yeah, my understanding is they're focusing really on all, all the ocean projects yeah. now, and and then you know, the Bayside projects are going to be the next. You know, after we get so this. So it was originally project. supposed to be fall twenty twenty five, but mm -hmm. we're not sure. And yeah. add time onto that, which that's already a year away anyway. So it all depends on a lot of a lot of it depends on the availability of the of the dredging at the Great Lakes. There's only a handful of dredging companies out there and sometimes right. they get pulled to a <laughs> storm in North Carolina or someplace else. Over there. What would so, you say the cost would be and would it be feasible for us to do it with the promise of reimbursement from the Army Corps? Is that's that something question. that's ever mm -hmm. arranged? That. <laughs> <laughs> I would only do that if the Army Corps didn't want to participate in the project. Yeah. I think my, my advice is um, what uh, Kristen was talking about, which is getting some sand from the intracoastal dredging, covering this over temporarily. It's a natural solution. Uh, whatever sand does get around the end, we can recycle it back and let the Army Corps chew on this and do their engineering. They're good engineers. They just take a lot of time. Um, and if they come back and they say, no, we're totally not interested, okay, then let's look at you know uh, what it would look like what you just described was four years. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, maybe three. Yeah. <laughs> but the other thing is, um, this qualifies under um, under uh, under state law for a fifty percent matching grant, just like East Hampton got for ditch claims. Mm -hmm. it's, un it's under the same law. You can get you can get fifty percent of whatever the project cost was. We we can apply for fifty. Yeah, we can apply. Yeah. Yeah. If you're right. eligible. Right. <laughs> Okay. And we would. From mm -hmm. New York State, yeah. you're saying? I'm good. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Arrow. We'll be in touch. Very interesting. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, everyone. I'll write Forgive to you me about if I don't shake back. your hand. There's <laughs> 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 yeah. a better by Saturday, will you? <laughs> this is better. Oh, yeah. I'll do you can sit next to Kelly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, do another pimp thing. Yeah, right, right. Well, they'll have an open tent. Oh, are you doing another one as well? We are. Okay. Uh, at, uh, at the same place. It's, it's going to be like a year later, and they're going to be like, yeah, yeah, okay. I know, I know. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. It's, I think it's supposed to be a smaller crowd, they're saying. It's actually part of like the ECD meeting. We're having a meeting on Saturday morning now. Kelly and I and Aram meeting with some of the residents over there. About the easements? Yep, just the status of you know, kind of an update about what's happening. Now. I think it's part of the Tiana Beach ECD. They have a their ECD meeting, so it's part of that. Okay. Oh, good. And Tom. Oh, I didn't call Tom. He's probably watching the meeting. Mm -hmm. He's outside. So I'm going by. Hmm? I like you. It's a gun. Mm. It's mint. Mint. No, thank you. Okay, next thing on our agenda is an update on the Head Start Simi building. And we've got John Ortiz, Deputy Supervisor, and Tom Howe. Good morning. Thank you, Good morning. gentlemen. So in late July, we got a call. Our office got a call from Tom regarding the condition of the Head Start building as uh, the workers were doing the demo of the uh, front facade of the building uh, in order to install the CME. Uh, museum. Yes. Why don't you take it from there, Tom, what you found? So the initial work was to demolish the bathrooms, the exterior wall for the expansion. Uh, they demolished the bathroom, bathrooms. We found some rotting plywood on the floor, which is not untypical next to a toilet flange sometimes in week. Um, so that brought our suspicions up a little bit. Um, and then when we started uh, demolishing the exterior wall, they started removing sheetrock. We encountered rusted steel studs. So the way that the type of construction that this building is, is modular construction. So it's a 
steel superstructure for each unit that was brought to the site, and then the walls, which are independent of the actual structure itself. Think of a steel box, just uh, uh, square sections drawn between them. Uh, the walls are steel stud, and their sheetrock attached to steel stud, and that makes up the section. How many so, sections are there? Uh, there, I don't know how many sections the place was built out of. Okay. Uh, I imagine between nine and ten sections. Uh, mm -hmm. It's about 9,200 square feet, so quite a large building. Mm -hmm. Every part of that building is modular, even the, the larger front section with the A-frame um, or pitch roof. Um, so they started disassembling the wall, and we encountered a wall that was essentially floating. Um, it was being held up by the sheetrock. The lower track, steel track that the studs sit in, was completely disintegrated, yeah. gone, rusted out, and then probably about 18, or there's a good three inches of separation between the bottom of what was left of the studs and the steel track. Just air. If you could push on the wall, the wall was moving back and forth like a bellows. Like it was, wow. um, it was held up by the sheetrock in that specific section. Um, the inside of the building had two layers of sheetrock, uh, probably for fire rating. The outside had a layer of sheetrock, so it was strong, but not structural, right? Um, so we encountered that uh, on the 19th, and then from there we wanted to figure out if this issue was related to that courtyard area, or if this was uh, gonna be found throughout the rest of the building. So building maintenance staff came in, we went to classrooms, we went to three different classrooms and a portion of the office space. We cut uh, two by two patches into the exterior wall <coughs> sections to try and replicate. Like we didn't want to blow open the entire wall in case it wasn't going to be found and we have to repair that. Um, but we wanted to expose a couple studs and the studs that we did expose were rusted. Um, they, some of them were separated. Some of them were just had corrosion on them. Um, so that showed us that, you know, this, this specific condition was um, likely to happen to every stud around the building. Um, just dependent upon what stage it was at in its deterioration. We then pulled the uh, original plan section from the building and it was a concrete foundation with concrete block up to the bottom of the steel stud. Uh, Can I see that for a second, please? Uh, do we have to stamp it in? No. Okay, there you go. I'll get um, back, I promise. <coughs> You're saying the foundation? Yeah, yeah. So. The top of the footing was below grade, the way it was designed. So you've got your footing, you've got grade, so and then you had concrete block that made its way up and sat on steel. There was a on the exterior wall. There was a brick facade. There was a like tar paper rain screen. Um, all of that was immediately in contact with the ground, with the subsurf, with the soil, right? Moisture laden soil. So that's unusual yeah. construction. Typically, uh, on your house, on any type of building, your concrete foundation ex uh, protrudes above grade, right? And then that's coated with asphalt or tar or something like that, a uh, waterproof membrane. And that's what keeps the moisture in the ground out of your building, right? And then your, your, your soap plate sits on top of that, and you build your house on top of the foundation so that your house itself isn't in touch with the ground. In this case, the ground was immediately in touch with the perimeter of the building. And the sill plate was below grade. Yeah, there was no sill plate in this instance, but mm -hmm. what would be the sill plate was at or below grade. Basically, um, it sat inside the foundation of the building. The ground, the ground came up is essentially what you're saying. No, not at all. It was designed so that the ground was higher than the foundation. Right. Uh, the ground was always Around, the site. Yeah, the, the, it, it ra raised above the perimeter of the concrete. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So you have this dry building, uh, conditioned building that's going to have a humidity between uh, 40 and 50 percent, it, it's going to kind of suck the moisture out of the ground around it. Um, right, right, right. Very interesting. Thank you. As a result, it's probably been rusting since it went in. And Can you go was into about 30 years ago? Yeah, 1991 was when it was constructed. Can you go into the project that we were actually doing? This was yes. something that we've been working so, on for years. When we encountered this, we were in the midst of constructing uh, an expansion of the, the front area of the building. So uh, previously, the Children's Museum of the East End occupied the uh, front 
classroom per se. Can I? Um, can I? I'm sorry. Yeah. Can I just pause you for one second? So we had knowledge of the inadequacies of the infrastructure for a while, or I didn't know until I read it in Riverhead Local. No, no, no. no. How would I'm we talking have about. about I'm talking about the, the just the construction. Do we do we have knowledge of the of the the infrastructure itself not being adequate bef before this investigation took place in before July? The construction. Bef did we know about the inadequacies of the infrastructure? The the you know the layout, the fact that the ground didn't have the type of um, proper. We had nothing to suspect that it compromised. The okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Probably would yep. never check. Wasn't until you opened it up. Correct. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until yeah. just this July. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I don't know that anybody's looked at these plans since 1991. Right. So. That, thank you. Um, yeah. No, we didn't know about it. That's what you're asking. Um, so we were, we were expanding uh, the CME space. We were providing an educational area for them. Tall ceilings, wide open, a place to do arts and crafts and science projects and all that. Um, it was basically infilling the courtyard area. And then we were creating a new entry for the Head Start building as well as part of that. Um, we received grant funding to do it. It was a we went out to bid. We had a full capital project. The contractor started the initial demolition, and then we encountered this. And and s after seeing what we saw, we immediately put the brakes <coughs> on the contractor to limit any further payments to them. Um, we didn't want them to get any further into the project because it didn't look like this project was going to be able to proceed based on the condition of the remainder of the building. So what did you think of after you got <coughs> really into looking in the different areas of the walls? I mean, was there any way to salvage any part of the building? So the replacement of the steel suds itself, you can do. Uh, it's extremely labor intensive. It's removing the interior sheetrock. It's removing all the electrical. It's removing the exterior facade. You're, you're basically deconstructing the perimeter of this building. Like, you're removing the windows, the doors, the doors and windows are supported by the steel studs. Like, you could replace those. Um, but the height of the foundation and the, the foundation condition, this is just going to happen again. Um, in order to completely address this and, and be really on the safe side, you're either talking about lowering the grade around the building 18 to 24 inches, um, and then trying to slope that further away from the building so that water doesn't collect. Um, or you're talking about raising this modular building up so that you can now extend the concrete footing around the building so that only that portion is in touch with grade. It's a combination of the two, but if you're going to raise it, you might as well raise it all the way. Um, there's really no cost savings of raising it six inches versus 12 inches. Um, that combined with the replacement steel studs uh, would save this building, but we're talking about uh, a 30 year old modular building that's essentially completely compromised around the perimeter. Um, and we still don't know if the actual um, substructure of each modular unit has been compromised or not. We're not able to, to, to take a look at the exterior of those beams. Those beams might be rusted just like the studs, and I kind of expect they are. It's just to what extent are they? They're, they're thicker metal, so they're going to take much longer to become compromised, but they're also in contact with. And we're talking about a building that has 88 children in it. Yes. So. Um, and it also acts as the commercial kitchen, commercial kitchen it acts as the kitchen for Head Start. Um, they operate uh, to serve, I believe they told us, two other facilities. Right. It, serves, it serves the children at that facility, at the Head Start facility, less than a few miles away in Riverhead, and also children and or seniors uh, to a much smaller extent at the Bridgehampton location. <clears throat> so the long story short is that by the engineer's assessment, what it would take to rebuild this building or to renovate it so that it was habitable, that it was serviceable in, in, in the manner in which it's been used for the past 33 years was just financially untenable. So that being said, we got in touch with uh, the Head Start uh, personnel, uh, their program directors um, by late July, and we've been in contact with them uh, that this building will be no longer serviceable or made available to them. You contacted they, them as soon as you found out? Yes. We have... What was the, what was the date you contacted them? The first week, I want to say August 1 or 2. It was right, it was right in there. Because I have a problem with this whole thing is that 
I walked it downstairs in one morning, and Nick said something, hey, look at this, which it was when he first started to, you know, when he first got a picture, and that's the last time I heard about it. Mm-hmm. And then I have to hear from since on Facebook about this. There's a lack of communication for the whole board. It's not, she's not excluded from this that we were not notified about this ahead of time. This is the first time I heard about it in work session. It's pretty darn bad. I mean, I read about it in the paper yesterday. And that Michael knows nothing about it. <coughs> he knows a little, little bit more than us, but not too much. Well, I'll, I'll, no, I'll say that Tom, when he found out, he came and asked to tell me and that, tell me what was happening. And when Tommy John said as the liaison, he would take the lead and communicate with the Head Start people to make sure that they were fully informed so they could start looking at what they could do. And he also said he was going to reach out to Fred Thiel. And it looked like we were going to get some support and people from the county. I don't want to speak for him, but I'm sure he's and, and spoken to a lot of people. Yeah, right. yeah I called over to um, all the local elected officials to apprise them of the of this situation but um, right. except for the have. ones that you sit at this table with but you're well, right. I, I can't speak to what you know or, or don't know and you know I, I mean that's what I was doing uh, with this so it, it is known to the community and also head start uh, started uh, you know went to the out to the community themselves and that precipitated right. you know the, I mean, uh, once the it was interview with the reporter by Tom here that the building would no longer be serviceable uh, I was able then to contact the Head Start program director, uh, and I even had a video phone call with them on August 6th with the Head Start board to tell them that there was no other buildings that we were able to identify for their use or even part of the, the building for their use. And you were communicating with Frank Sacone, the former. Yes, who initially he put, was the put first us point in contact on with uh, Annette Harris the program, the, the regional program director for Head Start. Uh, and those first calls we had, it almost took a week before we were finally able to connect with her and put let the messages. Uh, but by the first week, early in the first week of August, uh, we were able to do that. Uh, I then sat with the, on a Zoom call, with the, help, with the Head Start board to apprise them of the situation, the assessment by our engineer, the lack of any other identifiable buildings in the area to be used. Uh, when that Zoom ended, Tommy John was out of pocket. Later on, he then sat in on the Zoom uh, there on August 6th uh, and went from there. Uh, in the meantime, Tommy John has followed up with all local uh, politicians to apprise them of what was going on and to see the extent to which any other buildings would be made available. I also reached out to Cheryl Pedisich, the interim <coughs> superintendent for Riverhead School District, uh, to apprise her of everything, as well as to their universal pre-K special education coordinator, Jacqueline Ruggles. Uh, she and I most recently spoke yesterday. What we found out almost immediately was that of the 88 children that use this facility, <laughs> Uh, 55 of them are Riverhead School District's universal pre-K students, which was interesting. Uh, we also found out more about the building. We had uh, Janice Wilson to research the resolutions. The building was built in either late 90 or 91. There was a town, res- a town board resolution rejected uh, in that time frame for the construction cost of 1.5 or 1.6 million, hmm. which ultimately led perhaps to the decision to allow for the building to be built and support <coughs> in the modular uh, construction. Uh, since that time, the building has been used exclusively by Head Start pursuant to a $1 a month lease for the past 33 years. That most recent lease ended uh, with the town attorney providing us with a copy of that lease ending June 30, 2024. Uh, There is one wrinkle uh, that was brought to my attention this week. Uh, Back in December 2023, the town board voted to allow for the building to be renamed in memory of Mm. Annie Jackson uh, by her family and by her uh, work 
uh, in that area, in that community. So by your leave, I can contact that family to let them know uh, any such uh, naming of the building and or plaque would be held in abeyance until such decision as to what this property will be done. Not just with the demolition costs, which are anticipated, but also whatever for the future. Uh, you know, future will have. Uh, Tommy John you, uh, and I continue to, to reach out to a number of different people to see what other options there may be, but I can't speak to anything definitive because while well, everyone's been contacted out to see what or else can be done, uh, nothing's been uh, held fast that we could communicate it to the Head Start folks. Well, I guess first, how about our inventory of buildings? Do we have anything? I mean, you know, it, it, that the town owns that could possibly house the Head Start program in the short term. I, mean, I was thinking about maybe the, the senior centers, but then I was told that that's, they're too small. It wouldn't it's accommodate too small all the children. Tom, they, they said right now their immediate need is obviously a place to, to have the students, but also they have to get everything out of there and they need storage space. Why can't we let them move it into the West Hampton Beach building? That's a possibility. It's up to. There's plenty board. of room there. We have, um, we have it's it's the whole basement. We, oh, storage space. Yeah. We, do have a, we do have a 40-foot storage container at the West Hampton building that we could move. Um, we purchased it years ago for storage. Um, we could drop that in the parking lot for them to store anything that they don't have space for in larger items. Because, I mean, in my mind, this is getting this building back is has got to be priority <clears throat> one for us as far as construction and, and putting things together. I don't... I don't see putting a new community center ahead of, you know, a space for children. It just do, do the we, Riverside community. Do we have an understanding of when the next round of programming is set to start? September 4th. Okay. Um, there's no way the Flanders Senior Center is it can provide some op Not optimal space? Are you sure? They yeah, have children. seniors and have a warming kitchen. This has a commercial this kitchen. A commercial and the other kitchen. question is their yeah. commercial the kitchen. Could we move that kitchen to the West Hampton Beach facility? What facility are you referring to? The building that we have that's sitting vacant. One old Riverhead Road. There's no electric or plumbing or uh, the right amount of money for or anything. HVAC. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're just trying to solve an immediate problem with a building that's sitting empty and There's doing a, nothing for us. <clears throat> Since the majority of the students is off in Riverhead, does Riverhead have anything they can do? I've heard nothing. And apparently all of the classrooms are overfilling as it was, there was a meeting we had with the Riverhead School District regarding the sewage treatment plant two, three weeks ago, uh, or immediately before we found out about this, which is why I had the interim superintendent's name and number. And I called her and spoke to her at length, and she was able to confirm, yeah, she doesn't literally have any other room. Uh, and they're, they're well aware of this head start uh, is scrambling. Uh, it seems they have a level of difficulty in laying hands on what is available in the community themselves. Mm -hmm. They're uh, a big so organization, aren't they? They are, and headquartered, federally funded, and the like, but in all of my contact with them, which has been considerable, I've seen very little relationship or reaching out between local Head Start and the powers and or money that, that obviously resides in They the actually project. have a building and a piece of property that adjoins the Phillips Avenue Elementary oh, School. Yes. Now the building is, is hasn't been used in, in many, many, many years. Uh, the next stop for that structure is, is the dumpsters. But they do have a piece of property there that, that they own. Oh. And, um, you know, so that's something and any construction, Cindy, I agree with you, you know, I, I mean, at the best case scenario, I mean, what, what are we thinking a year, two years you know, for, for, yeah. for something, right. There's definitely the option of classrooms where in but you're very, they have their own piece of property. They do. Yeah. That's, what's yeah. the size of this acreage? Do you know of the one that we yeah, own? It's pretty significant. I can find that out for you. Um, I do not believe that the. I'd have to check. I was going to say whether or not the other piece they have could support a building of this size, but 
I think the other pizzas are now acre and a half that Tommy John's taken over. Mm -hmm. it, there, there are options there, as it was my point, and options that they have. But right now we are in preliminary, very you know, cursory uh, contact with Suffolk Community College. They do have the Culinary Center. They have the and, river, the Riverhead and Campus the Riverhead as well, Campus, but which is in Southampton. But that yeah. you know, okay. their, their charter is something different, and um, you know, so that it, we're essentially trying to work with Head Start to get right. them housed temporarily. There is also the kitchen that was just redone at the corner where Homeside Florist was. It's like a community, like it's a flex space where you could go in and you can use the. It's like a, it's an industrial kitchen mm. that anybody can come in and use. It's a shared space with the Food Institute. At the at Southampton, it's at where Stone Side Flower Forest used to be. It's in Riverhead. Corner. Oh, okay. On the corner, yeah. and there's the Food Institute has a full kitchen there. Oh well, yeah, they that have perhaps the, they could get yeah. space, yeah, you know, to use. There, right? Oh, right. Yeah, right. right. That place. Right. Um, no, that's been, a big empty building. Been in contact with all the churches, and all, I, I believe, in mm -hmm. that same location, they, they've also looked into that. Okay. I mean, um, I just. As far as their immediate need for storage, I'm totally fine with them putting everything in West Hampton. Or so in the in the tray, what right, do you call the it? So, so the a, container. on the storage end of it, they've requested and have had access to the building since this Monday, okay. since 9, 9.30 this Monday. Uh, I personally, Tommy John, we walked through the building this last week on Friday beforehand. I was impressed. It, it, it's a school. It's a miniature school. They have a huge, good-looking, commercial, functional kitchen. They have more large, oversized classrooms. Uh, to have two, three offices for the school administration, and then three or four or five other offices for counseling, health care, and whatnot. It, it, it's, it's noteworthy. And then parking, and then obviously the, the children's museum to go up front. So to replace this and to do it well well enough that we learned from the from what was cost effective back then which got 33 years out of it you know is 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 not going to be cheap uh they don't have a place for storage we could obviously provide you know a trailer or whatever like this but they're going to want to use as much as they possibly can and right now they're going through uh the offices and whatnot all of which is accessible uh, to take out and to to kind of keep the balls in the air for what they want to do with their program. That's so I'm just I just mentioned West Hampton because it's it's an empty space. It's not being utilized at the moment, and for storage for them in the interim to basically have a place to land all this stuff because it's if you're talking about a commercial kitchen and all these other things, that's a lot of space right. that they're going to need. And I think moving it to there and then giving them some breathing room to figure out where they're going or what we're doing next right. even is. Potentially. I, I, you're, you're, I'm sorry. Your point is well taken, except we're not dropping this building anytime soon. Oh, I know. So we're, we're okay, you know, and the HVAC still works. Nothing's getting trashed. Nothing's becoming environmentally challenged. So everything is okay right where it is right now until such time as there's a resolution to allow for the demolition. And even then, so they've got a very good storage location right now. And they'll take what they need to some other location, but yes, to your points, well taken. I guess my my major concern is the the programming and when you know ensuring that their programming can start mm -hmm. and the students are served adequately. Um, you know, I guess one of the things we may want to look into is is really figure out if if, if you know Suffolk Community College can assist. I know that you've reached out. I, I'm happy to help out in any efforts as well. I you know I know the union president of the FA. Uh, Dante Morelli, there's a lot of, you know, obviously um, um, uh, efforts that they like to take on that are service oriented. This could be something that they may be willing to kind of at least look at for us. Um, and as well as the Riverhead County Center, you know, our, our partners at the county, if, they're, if they, they have any space at that, at that, in that building. I know there's some areas in that building that aren't used anymore um, or are at least aren't used fully. So maybe we can also look into that and, and ask the county if they're willing to, to help out in any way, shape, or form. That's just my... I just wanted to point out that, you know, the 55 students that are Riverhead School District students, you know, every kid in Riverside and Flanders in the town of Southampton is a Riverhead School District child. Mm -hmm. So they're right. 
Southampton Town. I mean, whether they're kids, us or one hundred percent, the short kids, they're, they're they're the kids in the yeah. community. So, yeah. yeah, but we have reached out, and now also with Tommy John, I have a laundry list of people that we've reached out to to find out what else is in the location, uh, and I'm still following up two or three times a week with with Head Start, and I've just made myself the point of contact with them <clears> for the town, uh, just you know to have somebody. What are the other thirty? Two students, two or three students. They're Hampton town, of, town of Southampton. Mm -hmm. They're non contractually related to Riverhead. Could be Hampton Bay School out. District, could yeah. be someone else. ESM could be. Well, that was one of the discoveries was that, you know, we were actually housing 52. 55 students from the Riverhead, you know, right. funded by the Riverhead School District, right. which is which there was no which is hesitation like, or we've been saying to Riverhead, it is us too. It's well, that's the whole yeah. thing. Yeah. I mean, we're going to the yeah. table saying, you know, yes, we're part of your school district. Yes, we help out mm -hmm. when we can, and now we have this situation, and I think it needs to be a huge priority for us to get yeah. this building or some facility for them back online as quickly as possible. So, and that's what I'm saying. I'm like, if we're if we're going to come to the conclusion that no matter what, this building has to be demoed. The faster it comes down, the faster we can right. work towards getting something up. Right. Right. There's so. a short-term term challenge of getting the kids, the children, in a facility now. Well, maybe that one up. And then getting something in the Cindy future. Said the one on the that used to be Homeside Florist. If that building is functional and empty, that's a large facility. Pretty big. Well, the Food Which Institute is does their programming out of there, and they do a farmer's market. Mm -hmm. You told me the one at, on um, 105 and, yeah, and 20. Yeah, 58 and 105. I think they were, they were, that was in the middle of renovation. I'm not sure where, where that is. I think it's got to be close. It's but they were, they were doing a whole commercial kitchen to have this, you know, you could come in with as a small business and utilize that kitchen facility. And I'm sure if we, you know, reached out to them and said, listen, we have a school that needs, you know, use of the kitchen x amount of hours with well, so classrooms too though right i mean that's the main thing right classroom yeah that, but that that place i don't think it's all big it's one big open space where they put yeah, no, in stalls I'm for familiar with it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, i don't know if our classroom now right. i don't know yeah. let's circle back but, with head start and see how they're doing yeah. and we will yeah. compare yeah, notes what if there's any i mean, if there's any space I don't in the know county if anybody center reached out so. to um living water full gospel church they used to run a school out of that building the church is a part of contact okay And what about support from the state or other municipalities? Well, that's going to take some time. I, I, you know, I, I think it's there. Um, but uh, and I know that universal pre-K is a priority in the state. Um, you know, but, but like I said, even if they, you know, wanted to do this tomorrow, you know, we need funding allegations, grant requests, and then the actual construction. How much are the? Do we know how much like? So. I think that's certainly part of this. The trailer, like trailer classrooms that Riverhead School uses. I don't know. Had to find out. Could we find out that? Yeah, those. Tra I actually, when I went to Riverhead High School, I took math classes in those trailers, <laughs> uh, and this is two thousand seven, um, and they were portables. At they that were. point in time, uh, I believe they had a bathroom. They were. Large Even if we could maybe those. put those on their property while we take care of what we're doing on ours. We can look into it. Or why maybe no. they'll end up using their property. I mean, if they have an acre and a half that they already own. Well, then we could demo ours and put the trailers on that for now. Or, yeah. you know. Yeah. I suppose so. And, and their property is not in great shape. You know, the, the well, parking they, lot is grass growing up through it. And then they have a fence around the structure because the structure is that bad. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, I would consider but, it a but certainly a location. For these purposes. Oh, what's mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. I would consider it a vacant lot for lot. construction purposes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some demo, but right. nothing salvageable. Mm -hmm. The courthouse is just that and affordable building. Yes. Um, they are a different type of modular construction. Um, they are elevated on foundations and they sit on foundations with skirting around them. Um, Double these wides. were landed on foundations. Yeah, a little, a little different. Um, and trailers for preschools, preschoolers, yeah. little people. Hmm. Bathrooms are small. They take ramps, no steps. Anything else you want me to tell us? They're all 
Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. the projected demo cost is two hundred thousand dollars, approximately. Yes, we reached out to the current contractor that was doing the construction of the project, just because they're already part of the project. If we needed to demo this building, it would likely be the most reachable expeditiously. Um, so it's about two hundred thousand um, yeah, dollars. Would that would that be money that we've already earmarked for the, you know, the project? That they embarked on? No, that was that was grant money for CME, right? What's it called? Grant money? Yeah, so part part of it was grant money from CME, part of it was town money. So was it a bond or just town money? I you'd have to ask the controller. Uh, they just they there just was a grant there yeah. was a grant from the county. Right. Yes. Right. Pretty and large and grant. And CME's been made change. aware of everything and has been updated from as soon as we were able to say this was not really financially feasible to move forward. To get a grant from your program. I, guess I mean, that's the, the, question. the positive is we could get a space that's completely, you know, functional for all of the uses now. Yes, right. I, I want to reiterate that we really don't have a, an option at this point. And I did mention one institution, and you know, they, they I mean, it, it was, it was kind of like, okay, it's, it's nothing. We'll, we'll look. Right. It, no commitment on their part. Not in any bad way. It's just very preliminary. It's also you're geographically limited because yeah. they can't you can't have parents driving right. to Southampton right. in the traffic to drop their kids off to go yeah. to work. It's just not going to happen. Be late for work and late for <laughs> late to go to school. Right. But we did a complete survey of all available churches, town buildings, and whatnot in in that kind of area. Yeah. All of it through there, and it's you know even you know the Crowland Center. Squeeze in half of this school, yeah. and that would. Really how many? I'm sorry. How many students again? Eighty. Eighty eight total. Between five classrooms. And yeah. and then there's the kitchen that services All more than twice five. that number and another yeah. hundred right. plus. And then there's two offices. There's a, a school nurse. There's a therapist office. There's enough facilities to operate the school. How many square footage is that now? Ninety two hundred square feet. Ninety two. Pretty good size. Mm hmm. But for 33 years, the town did a good thing. We collected 300 and we did some notes. 364 dollars in rent. Six, no, 396 dollars in rent. Over that time. One dollar a month. I provided you with the uh, union president of the Suff Community College. He said that uh, the college is happy to look into this and would probably be uh, interested in helping. So um, I've given you his contact information. I would recommend reaching out. Thank, Thank you, Michael. Michael. Sure. If he had known earlier, he could have called earlier. Well, uh, we, we have Apologies reached out to him and <laughs> the administration. Yeah. He's already reached out yeah. from last but, week. Yeah. Oh, you were reached out to the college already? Yes, I did. Okay. Great. Okay. So, thank, thank you for that right. story. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> okay, that brings us to the town council member <clears throat> and supervisor liaison updates. Councilwoman McNamara, do you have anything you want to I do, but I'm not prepared at the moment. Okay, Michael? Uh, yeah, just a couple of things. Okay. Um, so I'll just say... Um, we um, are in the midst of our planning committee for Shinnecock Heritage Day, which is expected to take place on October first. Um, we're, um, you know, we're working to identify, you know, the run of show. What's, you know, what's going to take place on that day? And I can tell you, you know, we have a couple of um, uh, tribal members who are very excited about it, um, as well as some of our own team here at the town uh, who are working with us on that. So I will look forward to having more of an update um, as we sort of solidify those plans um, after our next uh, planning committee meeting. Um, <clears throat> I'll also say that um, uh, me and Tom Houghton, um, as well as Tom Neely, um, our co-chair with the Traffic Mitigation and Safety Task Force, um, went out to a couple of site visits this week. We uh, looked at some roads in Bridgehampton as well as um, a, a location in North Sea 
to identify some of the issues with respect to traffic over there, those two locations, and um, actually three locations. Uh, we had two, uh, two locations in Bridgehampton and one location in North Sea. Um, and, um, you know, uh, Tom H. is preparing some recommendations as well as Tom Neely, um, and we'll look forward to working with Highway once we get those recommendations. And um, we'll also, you know, when, if needed, we, we may also, uh, in some of the parts of Bridgehampton that we're looking at, there's uh, sight distance uh, interference. So we may want to engage with uh, Ryan Murphy and public safety to make sure that's various um, homes on some of the corners um, of Maple Lane and Lumber um, may um, need to, um, you know, clear some of the vegetation that might be blocking some of the traffic. So we're looking at it. We're going to look at what, what needs to be done. And um, uh, I'm hoping that we can have some solutions going forward. Yeah, yeah looking forward to that, too. Thank you. Uh, I've just been, you know, working on the budget every spare minute, meeting with Dorothy, going through all the <coughs> department head requests and <coughs> trying to make it work. It's challenging. Then we're going to have a meeting about that, you said, to go over the budget beforehand. Well, you know, I'm supposed to present the budget to the um, board on or before September 30th, but I'd be happy to meet with you all in groups if you'd want some insight into what's happening. That'd be a very good idea. I don't think that was done previous. All right, and Bill, what do you have? Um, last week I met with Councilman McNamara and Deputy uh, Highway up in East Quag about the no parking, and we came to an uh, idea. We're just waiting to get some input from the county on that. Uh, I spoke to the deputy. Highway yesterday, he said he's continue on the next phase of the sidewalks down by um, Remsenburg. No, the bridge. By down by the bridge, Remsenburg is Hampton still Bays. coming. Hampton Bays, and then I took a tour with Ed Thompson and the deputy supervisor up at the Southampton transfer station to how to we can improve it and clean it up and see what it needs. And the place is a mess. There's only one person there running it that day. And um, that was it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Uh, last night, Franca had uh, its its monthly meeting, a very interesting, <coughs> interesting meeting. Uh, generally speaking, they are um, pleased with uh, the direction uh, that we're taking with Wildwood Lake that, you know, there is, uh, you know, a change over there, uh, as we know, it was inundated with non-residents, um, and so we've made some changes there. Uh, there's still some work to be done, and uh, you know, so there's still some folks, and and some of the members of the community did indicate that. Um, and I, I just want to let you know, Mike, that Franca is is uh, planning to have a watch party for the traffic mitigation task force. So oh, they're wow. going to set up their own meeting and their own feed to watch. Uh, the meeting, so I, I thought that was kind of exciting and good for them. You know, they're they're plugged in and and they're you know they're watching what happens in their community. They had a presentation last night from uh, Sepa Muher, and uh, it was on human trafficking on Long Island. It was very interesting, uh, and it was good for the folks in the community and really for everybody to hear about uh, the the various signs of of human trafficking and uh, the populations who are vulnerable in that. I, in that, and it does happen in New York State, and it does happen on Long Island as well. So, so um, the courts have set up a new court mm -hmm. uh, system just to address the human trafficking. You know, it was right. press conferences that right. uh, District Attorney Attorney and uh, Administrative Judge Cracker uh, talked about that this week. Yeah. So it, it's happening. Uh, vulnerable populations; these are children and teens in foster care, people who struggle with substance abuse. Uh, LGBTQ youth, runaway, homeless youth, and uh, of course, people in economic hardships, uh, poverty, or or immigrants. A lot of the um, populations that you would imagine. It was very uh, informative and inter interesting presentation. I would certainly highly recommend it. Uh, also, last week, the Hampton Bay's Alliance had a meeting. Uh, they uh, got a presentation uh, regarding the pattern book that we are working on. And, uh, and I, I believe it was a very positive meeting. There was uh, input, uh, you know, for, against, you know, uh, and it's not, I, I shouldn't 
put that in broad terms, they were discussing the aspects of the proposal that we're looking at. So um, I thought it was a good meeting for Hampton Bays. It was held in the library. There was about 175 people there. Um, I found uh, the, the setup to be uh, very conducive to that kind of meeting. They had every everyone sitting in a circle, like a large, you know, like rings of people in the circle. So all of the energy was uh, focused toward the, the center of that meeting and uh, people got to speak their mind and ask questions. Uh, it was essentially to meet Mr. Kaiola, who is one of the major, probably the major uh, investor slash developer over there if this were to, if things were to move forward. So he got to speak to the community and the community got to ask questions directly uh, to him. So I thought in all it was, it was good because it was a healthy exchange of ideas in Hampton Bays. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just have tonight, there is a concert at Good Ground Park in Hampton Bays at Yay. 6 o'clock. It is Wood Vibrations. <laughs> um, we are also partnering, or I'm partnering with UGS, our police department, and our youth bureau. We're doing a drug take back and a school supplies drive at the concert tonight. Um, there is also, as speaking with Tracy Colson, there was a Usually they do a school supply drive, and he wasn't going to actually do one this year. But so many, so many uh, agencies reached out and asked him, "Are you doing?" There's definitely a need. So there are um, collection areas at Southampton Town Hall, and also at the Bridge Hampton Flanders and Hampton Bay's community centers, and those will be picked up on September 6th. So if anybody would like to donate, they are available downstairs. Thank you. That's good stuff. All right, then uh, that's it for the updates. I have, uh, I move to uh, go into executive session to discuss acquisitions, personnel, get some confidential legal advice, and then close the meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks, everyone.